much simplified, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, well, um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is uh, Jens Kanievski. I'm a, I'm a postdoc in, in Copenhagen. And um, I'm very happy to be here to give you a short introduction to, to self-testing. And yes, indeed, I, I simplified the, the title of the talk and the content of the talk <laughs> because I thought that maybe uh, I don't want to be too specific. Maybe I just want to give you an overview of the topic, OK? So um, before I start, OK, so this is the QMath initiative. So this is a new quantum center in, in Copenhagen, which uh, is basically um, a combination of quantum information plus some mathematical physics. Can you? Where, where you are there? I am here. This is me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, so this this was taken on you know this one sunny day in Denmark that you have in the summer. So we were very lucky. Um, but anyway, so so if anyone is interested in, in either PhD positions or postdoc positions, you should uh, uh, have a look because there is there is some money to be spent on good research. <laughs> OK, so this is QMath. Um, OK, the outline of my talk is going to be the following. So first, I'm going to tell you very briefly what non-locality is. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what the concept of self-testing is and, and some, some basic examples. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, how, uh, you know, what kind of methods are available if you want to do self-testing from perfect statistics. So this is kind of if you have an ideal experiment where you see the exact correlations that you expect, what can you say? Um, and then I'm going to tell you how you can try to make statements even if your experiment is not perfect. Okay, So you see, see some noise in your system. And this is somehow the direction that I am interested in. Because um, you know, if you want to apply these results to anything uh, that is actually real, anything you can measure in the lab, you have to have uh, robust self-testing statements. And I'll finish with a summary of, of you know, open problems and some similar conclusions. And by the way, if there are any questions during the talk, please uh, feel free to, to ask me. I'm very happy to kind of make this interactive. Um, OK, so what is non-locality? So non-locality, or, or Bell non-locality, this is this, um, this very, very fundamental basic, uh, basic idea in quantum physics, is that if you study correlations between um, kind of separate quantum systems, and when I say separate, I usually, what I, what I have in mind is kind of spatially separated. Um, but in general, you can just think that you have subsystems which, for some reason, are not allowed to communicate with each other, OK? So, they communicate and exactly, but they, they do not. They are not allowed to communicate kind of during the this Bell experiment. Okay, so so. Um, <laughs> well, that's that's of course a very good that's a very good question. And then depending on what uh, what formalism you want to use, so whether you want to use a classical theory to describe it or a quantum theory, there are different definitions. But somehow the definitions. I mean, I'll, I'll show you a couple of them, but they are they are kind of well defined. But you're right, it's not a uh -huh. uh -huh. It would be nice, and I guess I'll give you a definition. As I give you, yeah. So maybe just just give me give me a minute. I'll I'll, I'll come to this. Um, so the usual setup is that you have these uh, two quantum systems, or you know, we might like to think of them as kind of boxes because we don't really know what's happening inside. So we have these two systems. You can perform some measurements on them, and then the idea is that you know, on each box, on each system, there is multiple measurements you can perform. Okay, and these x and y they correspond to the different measurements you can do. So you can think that maybe you can measure you know sigma x or sigma y, um, and then you get outcomes which are just a and b. And in this, this whole uh, self-testing uh, world, or device independent, because that's also how it's often called, because in some sense we want to we wanna, um, make you know, the, the, the minimal assumptions about the devices. So people call it device independent. Um, the only object you really have access to is this probability distribution. Okay? So you don't assume anything that's, that's kind of happening inside the devices. Um, you don't know what's happening, but you know that these statistics are somehow well defined, and by repeating the experiment many times, you can you can estimate them to to arbitrary precision. Okay, and so, okay, so I guess this would be the definition of of what it means that the devices are not communicating during the experiment. Okay, so in the classical world, 
um, what what could these devices do? Okay, so it seems like okay. So so I want to give you this this kind of formula. So this probability is a uh, for now forget about the the summation over lambda. Okay, if you forget about the summation, then it's really uh, you have some kind of local response function on on the the, the Alice box. Okay, which is just um, you know the probability of A depends only on the input and this lambda that for now I'm ignoring. And then there is some res local response function on Bob, okay? And then it's a product. So in some sense, without the, the summation of the lambda, these boxes are just uh, product boxes. Their behavior is independent, okay? And then the reason why I'm summing over lambda is because, well, I can take convex combinations of these product behaviors. So that's exactly what I mean, um, that these boxes are not allowed to kind of communicate during the experiment. Okay, that's so. The, okay, so the lambda. So you should think of that. Okay, so some people call this the local hidden variables, but some people call it the pre-established agreement. Okay, you can think that lambda pre-established agreement. So lambda. <laughs> so lambda is this kind of. So you know, imagine that these two boxes they talk before the experiment. They agree on some strategy. This is the pre-established agreement, and then during the experiment they act. Uh, according to this strategy, okay. So this is the lambda. But somehow the fact that during the experiment, I mean, you know, so, so what you can see is that this x doesn't appear in the term corresponding to Bob's outcome, and and vice versa. The y doesn't appear here. This is essentially what uh, what captures the non-communication. So you can kind of see that this this y is not allowed to go through to this outcome, uh, and 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 vice versa. And that's uh, that's kind of the non-communication. That's the pre-established agreement. That's true. That's true. Exactly. So, so the communication. But that's the interaction before the experiment begins, and somehow this this uh, this assumption of non-communication. This. Thank you. 
So, so the meaning? <laughs> the meaning, sorry, the, the meaning of, of the meaning of past in this expression, uh, you can see it in the fact that lambda does not depend on x and y. Okay, so lambda is something that they agreed before, before x and y were even chosen. Okay, so somehow this is something that existed. And then later in the experiment, okay, the x comes in, but it only affects this term. Exactly. Yeah, so this is the pre-established agreement. They agree on the lambda, but then after that, they get the x, and they have to kind of deal with it on their own. And they get the y, then they have to. So maybe just to, just to kind of make it, uh, make it clearer, I can, I can write down the corresponding expression in, in quantum mechanics. Maybe this will. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll try not to. Um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, uh, then we would say the non-communication assumption during the experiment means that Alice and Bob share a bipartite state rho AB. Okay, and they do some. And okay, and we assume that this state has a tensor product structure. Okay, so there is there is the Hilbert space of Alice, there is the Hilbert space of Bob, and then Alice performs a measurement uh, which I, I denote by P A of X. So X is the input and A is the, the outcome, and similar for Bob. And the statistics has to be of this form. So in the Bell experiment, this is what quantum boxes are allowed to do. They are allowed to produce probability distributions of this form where rho AB is, is an arbitrary quantum state, and, and P's and Q's are, uh, are valid quantum measurements. OK, so, um, so going back. OK, so, so we say that a probability distribution is local if it can be written like this. OK, and it's an, uh, this is supposed to capture what a classical theory can do for you. OK, a classical theory in which properties of objects kind of exist, whether you look at them or not. Um, you know, you can kind of reason that uh, statistics should be of this form. And if, um, if you cannot write your probability distribution like this, then we say it's non-local, or that it violates some Bell inequality. Okay, these, these two are equivalent. And I guess the, the interesting thing about quantum mechanics is that, indeed, it violates Bell inequalities. So you can find quantum systems and measurements such that if you do this computation, you will get something which doesn't look like this. Okay, and so, and so this, is a, this is a very fundamental observation. Um, and so, okay, and so, so you can ask, of course, okay, so uh, what kind of quantum resources do I need to observe these non-local correlations? And one very basic observation is that you need entanglement, okay? Because if your state is separable, and it, I take this to be kind of the definition of separability, which essentially means what I have is a convex combination of, uh, of product states, okay? If I have a convex combination of product states, and then I perform any measurements I want on it, well, it's very easy to see that the resulting statistics will be exactly of the form I wrote on the previous slide, okay? Um, so the statistics will be local. So this shows you that if you have a separable state, you will not see non-locality, okay? So entanglement is a necessary ingredient of, uh, of non-locality. Um, so, okay, so you say, well, if the state is separable, then the statistics are local, and then you can basically turn this, uh, this um, conclusion around, and you, s you can conclude that if what you see is non-local, then your state must be entangled, okay? But this is somehow a, uh, well, it's a, it's a kind of a qualitative uh, um, conclusion, but we want to make it more specific, more rigorous, okay? And essentially, can you, can you make any statement which is more, uh, more specific you know, given that you've observed some non-local correlations, and, and the answer to this is exactly self-testing, okay? So you can see self-testing as a way of, of uh, deducing properties of quantum systems based solely on correlations. 
Um, so I guess from the kind of the mathematical formulation of the problem is very simple, okay? You're given uh, the probability distribution, okay? This is somehow what you observe in the experiment. And you assume that this probability comes from measuring a quantum system, okay? And, and this assumption is somehow crucial because, I mean, you have to assume that there is some underlying theory. Otherwise, you cannot make any state. Um, and essentially, what you want to do is like you want to do the deduce properties of, of the state or, or the measurements uh, that gave rise to, these, uh, to this correlation. Um, and what is very okay? And then there are some. There are exactly. It's an inverse. Exactly. From the statistics, you wanna uh, you wanna go back to like what your state and your measurements must have looked like in the quantum formalism. So in some sense, it's a um, it's a very neat connection bec between something that's you know, macroscopic, like the statistics you see in the experiment, and this very abstract formalism, um, you know, in the language of mathematics. So I would say it's a, it's a very deep fundamental fundamental problem. Um, okay, and there are some, you know, there are some um, some technical things like, uh, you know, of course, some people say, well, you know, the purity of the state, uh, that's something you can always get for free because every state can be purified. Okay, I mean, we can talk about this. I personally like to make minimal assumptions, so I don't want to assume that the state is pure. I don't want to assume that the measurements are projective, uh, because often you can actually rigorously deduce it from the mathematics. And I think that's a neater way of approaching the problem. Um, okay, and then again, often in to make the problem simpler, instead of looking at the entire probability distribution, you will just look at some some Bell violation, okay? I mean, a Bell inequality is just a is just a linear uh, is just a linear combination of these probabilities, and essentially, uh, so you can think of it in the space of, of correlations, just a hyperplane, and then if you if you kind of exceed this hype, so if you if you exceed a certain value, then you know that you violated something. You know that you are non-classical, um, and this turns out to be a useful way of uh, of quantifying how. Uh, um, how quantum your system is, and, and also if you want to derive bounds on um, how close these the state and the measurements are to the kind of perfect uh, realization, um, looking just at the Bell value is a, is a very convenient tool. It just makes the problem simpler. You know, you reduce the dimensionality. So actually, in the, for this talk, we'll, we'll only talk about Bell violations. Um, so we don't have to look at the entire probability distribution. Um, Okay, and, and for the purpose of this talk, we only care about measurements with two possible outcomes, okay? And so uh, a measurement with two outcomes in, in my language is just two positive operators, positive semi-definite, which add up to identity, okay? And it turns out that, that these guys can be very conveniently written as an observable, where I just basically take F0 minus F1, um, and, the, and the convenient thing is this mapping is one-to-one. -one. So, so any Hermitian observable, no, they don't have to be projectors. They can be. They are just positive semi-definite operators. Mm -hmm. And still, they add up to one. They add up to one. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very. It's, it's easy to see that that in this particular case, when we only have two outcomes, this mapping. So so basically, I. This you should think of this a as a as a convenient way of writing down these two operators together. Okay. Uh, but the. Uh, the f's. The, the, uh, they are positive semi-definite, yes. Hermitian and positive semi-definite, yeah. So uh, what's the difference? How can they be expanded into projectors? They have this some expansion into projectors. Yes. Yes, but... But, but there are various contributions. Exactly, yeah. So maybe the simplest, I mean, so... so Correct, yes, yes. So for example, one thing you can, uh, yeah, so, so for example, okay, we are used to thinking of, of, uh, of these Fs as being projectors, and then what you get in A, you, you see that the spectrum of A is basically either plus one or minus one. But somehow I wanna be more general. I wanna allow things in between, okay? And a typical example, you could, you could think of a measurement which um, essentially ignores the quantum system and just generates randomness. Why Fs are not observable? Why do you have to take this combination of Fs? Ooh, um, Why A is better than F1, 0, and F1? Um, I think maybe this is just... Uh, 
I mean, okay, so you know, if I if I wanna uh, if I'm asking what is the probability of seeing outcome say zero, I'm gonna take trace of f zero with my state, okay? Um, and so so that's what I would call a I don't know a POVM element or measurement operator. I mean, their, the nomenclature is not very consistent with this, but that, that's how I think of this. And then I call this the observable. Uh, just, just because you know, I guess other people call it like that. But okay, maybe the no, it's the nomenclature that's the. For me, these are the basic objects, and this is just a mathematical construct that allows me to represent them conveniently because it's kind of a, it's a compact way of describing it. I guess, I guess, what you mean by an observable that kind of depends on what. Uh, um, Yeah, but the thing is, okay. So you know, so since I care about correlations, it's kind of very easy to see that in this language of in this in this world of correlations, the labels of x and y and a and b they they don't matter. That you can you can you can take them without loss of generality to be from one to d or just any symbols. Okay, so somehow the labels don't matter. So also the fact that in here I have specified the spectrum of my a to be between one and minus one, that's just out of convenience. I could have just as well. Uh, taken some other combination which would make this spectrum different, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect the, the result. I could, yes. Yeah, yeah. So in some sense, um, for me, these are the basic objects, and then the zero and the one, they are just labels. So I could replace them with, you know, with like alpha and beta. This wouldn't change anything. But of course, when I want to write down in, um, in the mathematical language, it's kind of convenient to think of the observable as, as having eigenvalues between plus 1 and minus 1. And, um, but if f0 plus f1 is equal to 1, that is something fixing the scale. It's, it's only fixing the scale of probabilities. But you can, you know, you, I could think that actually the, the measurement that I construct, OK, it has these operators f0 and f1, but the corresponding eigenvalues could be plus 5 and minus 7. I mean, this wouldn't change anything. But if positive. Uh, the operators are positive, but the eigenvalues that I kind of that I assign to them, they could be anything. So, so I'm just saying, for me, no, this they is. Sorry, no, no. But I mean, okay, because in You're here, about a. yeah, yeah right. when I when, when I define this a, you can kind of see that what I'm doing is that I'm saying, okay, my f zero, I'm gonna call the corresponding outcome kind of plus one, and then to f1, I'm going to call the corresponding outcome minus one, and this is kind of like the, the observable in the, in the physics language. Okay, so just maybe just to give you give you an example of what happens when these f's are not projective. Okay, the simplest example would be to say um, that uh, my f zero they are the same and they just equal identity divided by two. Okay, so this is a measurement that essentially throws away your quantum system and just generates one bit of randomness. Okay, and then you can kind of see that the corresponding observable a is just identically zero. Okay. So then you see that, that indeed, um, if your measurements are not projective, the spectrum of A is not just plus minus 1, but it's also anything in, in between. Okay? Um, but I'm saying this mapping is very convenient, because indeed, any Hermitian operator, which has spectrum between minus 1 and 1, um, it corresponds to a valid combination of F0 and F1. Okay, and then from now on, I will only be talking about these. Okay, I call them observables, just because it's a convenient way of representing the whole measurement in, in a single operator. Okay, um, so okay, so so um, so now I want to give you like the, the simplest and the, and the most common example of self-testing, and this is based on the on the so-called CHSH inequality, which is kind of the simplest Bell inequality. Um, and in the quantum language, the CHSH operator is written like this. Okay, so you have a zero. So so now zero is the is the label of the, of the measurement on Alice. So Alice has two possible measurements, a zero and a one. And Bob also has two possible measurements, b zero and b one. Okay, and I'm gonna write down an operator like this. 
Um, and then the bell value is basically the trace of that operator with whatever quantum state Alice and Bob are sharing. Um, and you know, now these A's and B's, they are Hermitian operators with spectrum between minus one and one. And it's not, e not hard to show that, that classically, OK, and now, of course, I have to kind of tell you what I mean by classically. But you can, for example, think that if I force the measurements of Alice, so the A0 and the A1, to commute, that would be like one notion of classicality, which, which coincides with this notion of local distributions I presented before, but maybe it's not so clear. So I can either, uh, you know, I can either um, force the, me the measurements to commute, or I can, I can restrict myself to separable states that, that is all the same. Basically, classically, this beta is at most 2, okay? which if you look at the operator, this can also be achieved by uh, choosing all these guys to be proportional to identity. Okay? And then you will see, okay, this term vanishes, but then this term gives me 2 times identity, and I get 2. Um, but actually, in quantum mechanics, you can do better than that, and you can achieve the value of, of 2 root 2. Okay, and this is, uh, this is this famous CHS inequality, uh, which, um, which in quantum mechanics can be violated. Okay? So what is, uh, what is now very interesting is that um, you know, not only can quantum mechanics violate this inequality, but in fact, if you see the maximum violation, so if you really see that beta equals 2 root 2, then you can essentially deduce what your state is. Okay? So you can basically say, look, my state, or the state that Alice and Bob are sharing, it's the maximally entangled state of two qubits, okay? Up to some equivalences that, that we understand well. Um, and, uh, and in order to like really, really like make this statement uh, precise, I have kind of have to tell you what are these equivalences, okay? And the best way of seeing them is to see what the limitations of self-testing are. And there are two very basic, obvious limitations. One of them is that you cannot see auxiliary systems, okay? So if you if I, if you see some statistics um, that that uh, come from some quantum state, um, you can never exclude the fact that there might be extra degrees of freedom. So in here, these these are represented by these tau's that somehow my measurements are not touching. Okay? You can never exclude that from uh, you know from uh, from being the true answer um, to to your problem. So there is this problem that. There could be extra degrees of freedom that you are not actually measuring, okay? And the second thing is that you cannot see local unitaries, okay? Because if I take my system and if I apply the same local unitaries to both the state and the measurements, of course, the overall statistics remain the same, um, but uh, of course, my state has changed, okay? Um, so essentially, this is the exact statement I can make, okay? So the state that Alice and Bob are sharing well, it doesn't have to be exactly a singlet, but it has to be something like a singlet tensored with some extra state up to local unitaries. Okay, and so this is precisely what I mean uh, uh, by a self-testing statement. Like, if I see these extremal correlations, then I know exactly what my state is up to these equivalences that I understand. Okay, so I kind of say, well, you know, I cannot deal with this anyway. So, so let me say, well, this is as much information as I can extract from my experiment. Why is it called self-testing? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think, or at least my interpretation is that, uh, you know, usually we are used to the, to the picture where you have an unknown quantum state, and then you use kind of trusted measurements to find out what the state is. This is basically tomography, right? Um, whereas in here, because you don't trust your measurements, so you can kind of think that the device tests itself. But I, I'm aware that this is not a very. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's what that's what they were thinking. But okay, you're right. I mean, the term self-testing is a is a bit strange. It but sounds great. Yes, of course. So that that's <laughs> Okay. So I guess what is what is what is very nice is that you know these limit this these uh, equivalences they are necessary, but they also turn out to be sufficient. So this really shows that that self-testing is a. Is an is a interesting is an interesting concept in, in quantum mechanics. Okay, and then maybe I can I can show you a very simple proof of that um, of of the the statement I presented before, and and the proof just goes via essentially taking the bell operator and squaring it. Okay, I mean this is something that I'm sure many of you have seen. 
If you assume that your measurements are projective, which basically means that they square to identity, so now if the spectrum really is plus minus one, you square it, you just get identity, and then a simple, a simple calculation shows you that the square of the, of the W operator, of the Bell operator, is just four times identity minus, and in here you have these, you have these commutators, okay? Um, if we drop the projectiveness assumption, so instead of um, kind of assuming that these equal identity, they are just the squares are upper bounded by identity because that's that's essentially what my spectrum condition tells me. We get a very similar expression. I mean, you have to do some work, but it's but it's not too hard. Okay, you get this kind of operator inequality where w squared is upper bounded by four times identity minus these uh, these uh, these commutators, and then you do some very simple upper bounds. Um, where at some point you forget about one party, okay? Because we know that these. Uh, so now I'm just taking some kind of matrix moduli of these of these operators, and then at some point when I see the modulus of the commutator, well, I know that the commutator is a is an anti-Hermitian operator whose eigenvalues are between plus two i and minus two i. So then if I take the modulus, I can just upper bound it by two times identity, and I end up with this with this very simple expression. Um, and then the last step is just to use the, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which allows me to relate the beta. Remember, the trace of w with the state is just the beta, um, with the trace of w squared with, uh, with my state. And w squared was, was upper bounded by this operator. <coughs> and then in the end, um, I get this, this very simple relation, which links the Bell violation with this quantity t, and this quantity is this is this kind of funny quantity which captures how incompatible the measurements on Alice are. Okay, and it's a, it's a good quantity because it um, because basically what you what you do is you take the commutator, then you take the modulus, and then you uh, and then you trace it with a state. So it's a it's a very simple, very natural quantity in which you really take. Um, I mean, what is the, modulus? the operator modulus. Yes. So, so this this commutator is an is an uh, it's a matrix, but it's an anti-Hermitian matrix. So the eigenvalues are imaginary. So then I just take the moduli of these eigenvalues. Eigen Correct. Yes. And then you take the sum. No, no. So this this is an operator. Okay. This is still an operator, and I trace that operator yeah. with my reduced state. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and you can kind of see that this is a this is a very nice quantity because. Um, because essentially, this operator, or, you know, the, the the magnitude of these eigenvalues tells me how incompatible my measurements are. Okay, and then by doing by taking the trace of that operator with my reduced state, I'm taking some kind of weighted average of like how incompatible the measurements are with respect to the state, which actually is a very natural concept because in the end, you want your measurements to be incompatible where your state lives. Okay. Yes. So this inequality. What is this state? So actually, it's, it's very, it's very simple. The inequality, uh, the, the the quantum system that saturates this inequality, is basically uh, a two-qubit state in which your measurements are not maximally incompatible, but they are just uh, you, you decrease the angle. The state is still maximally entangled. So, so there are many such states. Uh, there are many such states. Yeah. 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 But the reason why this inequality is saturated is because basically in all the derivations I showed you before, if the measurements are projective, you are actually not losing anything. Well, I okay. I mean, I, I could give you. Uh, I could I could give you examples of state that, that saturate all of this, but I um, I, I don't know about the entire set. Um, I just know that this inequality cannot be improved. So in some sense, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice and fundamental relation. OK, and what is also nice is that um, you know, so this beta, the classical value is 2. And so you can see that as soon as you exceed the classical value, so as soon as this is more than 2, you get a lower bound on t. Okay, so then you really see, okay, there must be somewhere, some you know, some uh, spot in my Hilbert space where these guys do not commute, and where my state lives. Okay, so it's a, I would say it's a very fundamental relation, and it's also very simple. And it works in the infinite dimensional space. 
It does actually, yes. So because the, I mean, because basically, when you look at the proof, the proof is so simple that it doesn't really use any of the usual simplifications that happen in finite dimensions. You can you can do all of this in infinite dimension. Um, okay. So so this is a nice relation. But now I want to focus on the case of what happens when beta is maximal. Okay. So if beta is maximal, two root two, then I can conclude that t equals one. Okay. And actually, from this. Um, it's not hard to show that uh, that um, you can essentially figure out what your a0 and a1 are, okay, up to local unitaries. And up to local unitaries, they really have to look like sigma x, and then maybe tensor with some identity that corresponds to the extra degrees of freedom, and sigma y, okay. So, and the reason why you can deduce that is because. Well, if you look at this operator, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned before that, that for the commutator, the, the eigenvalues are between plus 2i and minus 2i. And essentially, what you see, in order to, to see t equal 1, um, you have to have uh, this operator being kind of maximal <coughs> everywhere where your state lives, OK? Yeah, exactly. And that's the beauty of it. Correct. Well, if it's maximum, if it's maximum, mm -hmm. so, so you see, this is exactly. So in, the, in one of the previous slides, I showed you that, uh, that if I see the maximum violation, I can really deduce that my system okay, has a maximally entangled two qubit state, and then there is some other components to it, okay? possibly. But many papers a long time ago showing that the system is more dimensional. Mm -hmm. OK, so that has a to your exactly. Like, I mean, this is not my result. You know, this is, this is very old, of course. This is, this is like the beginning of self-testing, uh, late, late 80s, early 90s, depending on which papers you look at. But yeah, so this is very old, but you're right. In, um, it, is very, it is very interesting that uh, essentially there's just one, one uh, kind of arrangement that achieves the maximum violation. And this arrangement happens to be in a very small dimension, you know, in the OK. But anyway, so, um, so OK, so what is, what is very interesting is that, indeed, you can deduce exactly what your, what your measurements are. OK. And this is actually, this is really not too hard to show. This is a, a simple, simple algebra, um, simple algebra exercise. Um, and then, basically, once you know what your, uh, uh, what your measurements are, you know, you can re re repeat the same argument for Bob. So then you realize what the, what the, uh, uh, what the observables on the other side are. And then basically you can construct this W operator. Okay? And you realize this W operator is essentially a two qubit operator tensored with a you know, large identity, the identity you don't care about. And the structure of this two qubit operator is very well understood. Is the same? It doesn't have to be. It, you know, it could be the same, could be different. I mean, this is exactly where kind of your, the limitations of self-testing kick in. You know, you, you don't know. But in some sense, you don't care because uh, you only care about the, the, this qubit part of the state. And that the extra degrees of freedom, they could be anything. Um, yeah, so OK, so, uh, so I would say this is a, this is a, a you know, a almost, uh, well, this is a complete and, and rigorous uh, uh, treatment of this simplest uh, self-testing problem. So it really shows if you see the maximum violation of CHSH, then you know exactly what the state is up to these equivalences, and you know what your measurements are. So this is, some people call it the rigidity statement, because it really tells you, um, I know exactly what my system is. There is only one way uh, in quantum mechanics of achieving these extremal correlations. Okay. So this CHSH example is the, is the most canonical example in, in self-testing. Um, and as I said, this has been done many, many years before. But now, of course, um, you know, how, can you, how can you extend that? Um, yeah, so sorry. So this is exactly what. So this is the rigidity statement. You, you know exactly what the state is, and you know exactly what the, what the measurements are. Um, OK, yeah, so there's just one way of achieving this. Uh, OK, and why is, this, why is this interesting? Well, so I would say there is a, there is a couple of reasons. For me, for, from the foundational point of view, this is a very nice direct link between you know, the macroscopic world and, and the microscopic world. So that's, that allows you to make a very, very nice connection. Um, and also, if you're interested in uh, you know, the, limita li the limits of these, of these quantum correlations, I would say that self-testing gives you an extra, extra point of view on, on how to see these. Okay? So if you're interested in this, 
the, the quantum set, what correlations are possible in quantum mechanics, then it also becomes a very valid question. It's like, you know, what kind of state do I need to achieve these extremal points, okay? Um, and then from the applications, um, the, the most, um, the most, uh, well, okay, so there's basically two. I mean, one of them is what I call device-independent uncertainty relations, um, which, which is this kind of new field where, uh, you know, in the usual uncertainty framework, the assumption is that you know exactly your measurements, and then uh, you're saying, you know, whatever state I choose, I always generate some uncertainty, okay? Whereas in this device-independent framework, you say, well, I don't know exactly what my measurements are, but I know some properties of them, okay? And now I still want to uh, deduce some uncertainty that uh, comes out of my system, okay? And this is, this is I think, very, uh, very interesting because, you know, in reality, it's very hard to characterize your system exactly. It's very hard to know all the properties of your system. But, for example, using um, Bell violations, you can, you can sometimes deduce some properties of it, okay? And, and just to give you an example, you know, in, in, in here, um, knowing this quantity t, okay, you know, even if this t is not maximal, if this t is, say, one half, okay, although you don't know exactly what your measurements are, you know something about them. You know that there is some degree of, of uh, non-commutativity, and this, in, in fact, allows you to already deduce some uncertainty. So it's, a, it's kind of like you're doing uncertainty relations, but based on, on limited knowledge, which I think is actually relevant for, for many experimental uh, purposes, okay? Um, and the second big application is device-independent cryptography. So essentially you're saying, I have two devices, I want to use them for cryptography, uh, but I don't fully trust them. I don't know exactly what they are. So then essentially you can, you can use protocols like this, you can, you can, you know, you can um, use them to violate some Bell inequalities, to try to figure out what's happening inside your devices, and then if the statistics you see are satisfactory, then you can use them for, uh, for cryptography. Okay? Um, and of course, when you think about applications, you realize that you need uh, statements which are robust, okay? So they shouldn't apply only when your violation is maximal, but even if your violation is, uh, you know, is, um, I mean, they, they need to apply in the presence of noise and imperfections, you know, just the standard stuff you have, you have in any experiment, okay? Um, and this is essentially where I, where, where kind of my interests come in, how to make these relations robust, okay? And, um, and I think this is, okay, so, so this is what I'm gonna tell you in the, in the, in the next section, but before that, um, I just wanna tell you what is known about self-testing at, at this moment, okay? So of course you can ask which states can be self-tested, and of course I've already kind of convinced you that the singlet, so the singlet I just mean the maximally entangled set of two qubits that can be self-tested using the CHSH inequality, and then some people show that you can self-test all non-maximally entangled states of two qubits, um, and then some people showed using some other inequality that, that you can self-test some non-maximally entangled Q-trit states, and then there were some more results, but in the end recently some people showed that you can actually self-test all pure bipartite states, okay? And um, so I think this is, a, this is a very interesting result because it kind, of, it kind of shows that whatever bipartite pure state you take, uh, there is some way of measuring it such that the resulting correlations kind of um, constitute like a fingerprint of that state. If you see these correlations, then you know exactly the state that you have. And then uh, it kind of gets more interesting when you go to multi-partite states. We know that you can self-test graph states, you can self-test n-partite GHZ states, you can self-test three qubit W states, um, but at the same time we know there are states which you cannot self-test, okay? And that's, uh, um, so for in the multi-partite world, it's kind of much, much less is known, and that's also a very interesting problem. Um, but okay, but what I'm saying is like, if you're interested in the ideal statistics, then okay, we, we have a, a good you know, number of examples where we know how this self-testing problem works. Um, and, uh, and maybe just to give you, uh, give you an intuition how this is related to, the, um, to this whole idea of the quantum set of correlations, okay? So, so you know, this is like a, like a simplified picture. You have the local set of correlations, which is a, which is a polytope, okay? And then you have the quantum set, which is a, a convex body, which is strictly bigger than that, okay? And then here I just look at the CHSH inequality, and then uh, the beta equals two is exactly this hyperplane that kind of delimits the local set, but we know that the, uh, the quantum set is bigger, okay? So you can go further. And essentially what self-testing tells you is that 
this maximum violation, so the beta equal to root 2, uh, it's only possible at one unique point of the quantum set. Okay, so you should think that there is just one point, where I call it PCHSH, which gives you the maximum violation, and then you deduce that actually this point can only be achieved using this particular state. And then if you if you look at some other inequalities, so there's this, there are these tilted CHSH inequalities uh, in which basically you take the original one and then you add some, some marginal term with some parameter. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, these guys, they self-test partially entangled two qubit states. Um, then kind of the picture you should have in mind is something like that, okay? So the classical value is 2 plus alpha and somehow this is where the local set achieves its maximum. Um, and then the quantum value is, okay, it looks like this. It's always strictly larger than, than, beta, uh, than the classical beta. And again, it's achieved at a unique point, okay? So it's not, it's not the same point, it's some other point, but it's another extremal point of the quantum set. And then you deduce that actually this point can only be achieved using states that look like this. So somehow this is the connection between self-testing and the, you know, the structure of the boundary of the, of the quantum set of correlations. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then you know the the kind of the general open questions in in this field are, you know, why certain tripartite states cannot be self-tested? What are the fundamental reasons? And and you know, how can we tell whether a tripartite state can be or, or cannot be self-tested? And then you can ask very very general questions whether you know, whether every um, kind of non-trivial Bell inequality self-tests something. So basically, you know, if you if you take this quantum set and you pick some some extremal point, is this a self-test in general, or are we just very lucky that in the simple examples we know, they always turn out to be self-tests, but we don't understand it very well. Yes? A state. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, and the reason why we, I mean, usually, okay, because you know, like, usually we say, well, we self-test thing, we self-test states up to two equivalences. There is the, there is the extra degrees of freedom, and there is the local unitary, okay? And so somehow we say, okay, this is fine, we understand this. But the problem is for some, for some larger states, tripartite states, for example, there are extra kind of equivalences you have to take into account. And actually in this case, the, it, it turns out to be the, the complex conjugation is the problem, okay? Because basically you can take a system, like a quantum state and measurements, and then you can basically complex conjugate everything in some fixed basis. And again, you see that the measurements, uh, sorry, the statistics do not change, but somehow the two things are not equivalent up to unitaries, okay? And the simplest way of seeing that is like if you take uh, three measurements on a qubit, like sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, uh, and then you conjugate all of them, what you get is sigma x minus sigma y, sigma z. So basically you, you go from like a right-handed setup to a left-handed one, okay? And that's not equivalent under a unitary. So that, that's essentially the, so it's, it, like we know that in, in, uh, in higher dimensions, like, oh, well, in high number of parties, there are extra equivalences you have to take care of, and we just don't know whether these are the only ones, or there is like a larger class. It sounds very peculiar, because in normal quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. you replace the wave function by its conjugate, nothing changes, as far as uh, probability goes. Sorry, I'm not replacing the wave function by its conjugate. I'm, I'm looking at the, at the density matrix and the measurement operators, and I'm conjugating these. But that still means that the imaginary unit is replaced by no. Well, so, so just, I mean... Um, Take this x, y, x, uh, x, x, sigma, x, sigma, y, sigma, z, k. If he is conjugating only this i, which stands in sigma, y. Yes, so, so I'm, I'm conjugating the element y's, you know, the matrix elements. And this is not equivalent to kind of yeah. conjugating the... Uh, Yes. Well, I think it's just a very different way of. So I'm not I'm not conjugating the uh, the entries of the of the vector of the state vector. I'm conjugating the entries of the density matrix. So that's that's just a different operation. So 
this one we don't know. So see, okay, so, it, so this is exactly what I'm saying. For, for, bio, for, for pure bipartite states, we know that the only equivalences are these degrees of freedom and the unitaries, okay? And this is well understood. And then we know that for higher, for say for three parties, you have this transposition trick or, or complex conjugation trick, okay? Very good question. Yeah. So we don't know. So this is this is why why the problem gets gets uh, kind of more interesting, but also it seems very hard. Um, so yeah. So actually, not much is known about uh, about uh, higher number of parties. But actually, it's very interesting because you know people who study um, different equivalence classes of of tripartite states or higher higher number of party states somehow. When they think about equivalence classes, and for each class they have like a representative, so that's like a GHZ state or a W state, none of these states has any complex coefficients. Okay, so somehow this this promotes this 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 kind of mental picture that oh you know in the grand scheme of things these complex coefficients they're not really relevant. For some reason we can always get rid of them by local unitaries. Okay, or, or by whatever.